I hate to cut off the stories, but we're actually going to get started. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. So, hello, I'm Dr. Stephanie Rollins. I'm the AU Library Director, and I'm so honored today to have the uh, kickoff uh, program for Operation Welcome Home uh, in partnership with the 42nd Air Base Wing. Um, and so, uh, without um, before we get begin, I, I would like to thank several people for making this possible. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Muhammad Ali, who's the MISFRIC director. Uh, Lexi Aldridge, who is our library special collections librarian. Um, also, Mr. Tim Thomas, he's our outreach coordinator for the library. And also, um, the TLC and uh, Andrew from our library, the Teaching and Learning Center, because they were super helpful with getting the cameras set up and getting everybody online and working. So a lot of technology moving parts here, so we appreciate them as well. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to, um, to uh, oh, here we go. No. So um, to start us off, I would like to introduce Maxwell Air Force Base 42nd Air Base Wing Commander, Colonel Ryan Richardson, and he's going to provide a few brief welcoming remarks and also a little bit of, about the introduction so you know who we have before us today on the panel. So I'm going to let him take over. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, this, is, uh, this is an awesome opportunity as we've been kind of, I think, planning this for a couple months now. An awesome opportunity to listen to the three patriots. We had an opportunity yesterday with Colonel Ellis uh, and Dr. Ali's team, and that was an exceptional opportunity too. But this is on behalf of Maxwell Gunner, the Installation Command, uh, General Tullis, and all of Air University. Just an opportunity to say thank you, to listen, and to share. Um, this 50th anniversary of the repatriation of prisoners of war uh, from Vietnam, and a series of events that kicks off in earnest today and then leads us into March, the 12th through the 15th, with the Traveling Vietnam War Memorial, a 24-hour vigilance run, uh, and then an invitation to all the schools, and then eventually opening up the installation to come to view and to thank uh, all veterans that served in that conflict uh, and listen to remarks from a Medal of Honor recipient. So this is an opportunity to listen to three patriots and I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce them uh, to everyone here online and in the audience with us today. First, Colonel Carlisle Smitty Harris, United States Air Force retired, is the author of the book Tap Code, the epic survival of a tale of Vietnam P POW and the secret code that changed everything. In 1964, he served in the 67th, 67th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, where he began flying combat missions in Southeast Asia in March 1965. He was forced to eject over North, North Vietnam while flying his sixth combat mission on 4 April 1965 and was immediately captured and taken as a prisoner of war. During captivity, Smitty covertly taught other POWs the TAP code as a way to communicate encouragement, pass messages of resistance, communicate chain of command, and serve as a lifeline during internment. After spending 2,871 days in captivity, then Captain Harris was released during Operation Homecoming and returned home at Maxwell Air Force Base on 17 February, 1973. Colonel Harris currently lives in Tupelo, Mississippi. Colonel Leon Lee Ellis, retired is an award-winning author, an international speaker, and consultant on subjects like leadership and human performance, organizational integrity, operational effectiveness, and personal accountability. He deployed to Southeast Asia in July of 1967 and served with the 390th Tactical Fighter Squadron of the 366th Tactical Fighter Wing at Da Nang Air, Air Base in the Republic of Vietnam until he was forced to eject over North Vietnam while flying his 68th combat mission on 7 November 1967. After spending 1,955 days in captivity, then Captain Ellis returned home at Maxwell Air Force Base during Operation Homecoming on 17 March 1973, just one month after Captain Harris. Colonel Ellis currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia, and made it known yesterday that he is a bull, he's a dog fan. So, Captain Guy Gruders retired is the author of the book Locked Up with God: My Best 13 Speeches. Captain Gruders flew more than 400 combat missions for the 173rd Airborne Brigade in the 01 Bird Dog, a light observation aircraft, and then the Misty Fast Facts in the F1 in the F100F Super Saber. 
over North Vietnam. While flying as a co-pilot on the F-100F, he was shot down twice during his service in North Vietnam. The first incident required a parachute water landing and being rescued under heavy fire by two helicopter crews. However, on 20 December 1967, he was shot down again and was captured and taken as a prisoner of war. After spending 1,912 days in captivity, he was released during Operation Homecoming and returned home to Maxwell Air Force Base on 17 March 1973. Captain Gruders currently lives in Minster, Ohio. And again, on behalf of everybody here at Air University at the 42nd Air Base Wing, we just want to say thank you to these patriots and look forward to hearing from them today. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Colonel Richardson. And thank you to Air University, Air Base Wing, the library for the partnership on this programming. Um, also with us today is Louise, do I have that right? Louise Smitty's wife, is that correct? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I acknowledge her because she's actually the most important person of the duo. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to do was just kind of have you all talk about your experiences. And we have some brilliantly written questions. I didn't write them, but Lexi did. So we wanted to ask you a few questions, and then we'll entertain questions from the chat and also from the crowd. So the first question is, tell us about your most challenging or your most uplifting time while in captivity? Oh, is that for me? It can be for all three of you. And if you need a second to think, that's okay too. I'm trying to. Okay. As I said, let someone else start. Okay. And I can always repeat the question if you need me to. The most challenging okay. and the other was the most what? Uplifting? Uh, that yes. First question. Okay. Uh, there's uh, Lee also. <clears throat> I think probably the most challenging thing was just to have communication and operate as a brotherhood up there, supporting each other. And uh, I think that really helped us come home with pride and honor and uh, with the unity of, that we had with each other. I would agree with Smitty, and I would say it was the most challenging in some most of the time, but it was also the most uplifting because when you 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 were not alone because somebody had reached out and connected with you, it was so exciting and inspirational to know that you weren't alone, that your buddy was over there. And I can remember after my most challenging time when I got tortured the first time, and I got back to my cell and I felt like the lowest human dirt that ever been that worn a uniform because I'd finally given in and filled out a three page biography that only the only truth on it was my dad's first and last name. Everything else was a pure lie. But I felt so bad that I finally gave in. I just was I remember laying there and tied up in leg irons and handcuffs and just crying like a baby because I was so worthless. And I get back to my cell, and later, Captain Ken Fisher, who was my senior guy and my friend, said, Lee, you did the best you could. We're proud of you. You know, they can make us all do something, and you did it in a way that didn't give them anything. So we're proud of you. And that's what happened in every case over and over, that there were people there to encourage us when we were down. And in our culture today, I think that would be very helpful for our military to uh, and our veterans to be connected with when they're down, because it sure was. It, we'd faced a tough challenge, but when we bounced back, we had somebody there to encourage us, and that meant a whole big difference. For me, the most challenging was is that I had a bad experience with a, a friend of mine being beat to death over the first 30 days in a horrible way when he was helpless. 
And so I got, for the first time in my life, into terrible hatred, which developed worse and worse uh, under the next three or four months under the torture. And so uh, I actually had suicidal thoughts come to me, and I was very close to suicide. I turned to God. I got on my knees to Jesus Christ. And literally after six months of prayer, I finally was praying for those captors and torturers, and it totally turned my life around. I went from absolute hate and despair, not being able to sleep, to real joy and peace the last three and a half years of captivity. So that, that experience was both the worst thing that ever happened to me and the best thing, because I really found that God was with me. I knew he was with me. He literally was with me. And uh, I could see that where at first I didn't believe that he was even up there. And after those months, I realized that he was really there and he was in charge in prison camp. Amen, brother. Amen. So speaking of captivity, what were your feelings when you first heard that you were coming home? I can remember hearing them. Uh, they were required by the uh, agreement to notify us within 48 hours and to actually give us a printed copy of the protocol to the agreement, the protocol part of it about our release. And when they read it out loud to us or told us out in the camp yard, we didn't want to give them any uh, joy of taking pictures of us celebrating because they would package it as a way probably to say that they were right and we were wrong kind of thing. And emotionally, we were pretty flat. I was just very flat. So we said, okay, we'll wait and see. And so that's what we did. We'll wait and see until the day we get on that airplane to go home. <laughs> there were signs that we were to be released but I was in a camp up near the Chinese border and we didn't get the notice that we were going home when the people in Hanoi did, but uh, we, we had signs, uh, especially when we heard up those, all those trucks coming up <laughs> to pick us up. And uh, it, we took a trip for the first time that we're, we were not blindfolded in the trucks, and we knew that uh, we were going home. And the same thing, I was on that trip with Smitty, and it was the same way. I could hard to believe that it happened. And then on that way home, our commander asked us to tr relieve some of the irons and everything that we we're in. And uh, the, the, the commander, the North Vietnamese commander of that convoy, said, I don't worry, you'll be home soon. And that's the first time that I think we really believed that we were going home. So speaking about coming home and homecoming, um, can you tell us about your time at during uh, Operation Homecoming at Maxwell Air Force Base? What did it feel like to arrive and what did you experience? Uh, I arrived there at about two o'clock in the morning and I think there were maybe 15 or so uh, XPOWs on that airplane. I happened to be the senior ranking of the budge. So when I went down the steps first, uh, they put a microphone in front of me and asked me to say a few words. So I said some appropriate words, but I didn't know that the spotlight was directly on me and while I was talking, an automobile, automobile pulled up behind me. And uh, I, I, I don't recall seeing, seeing that until I turned around and there was Louise in the back seat with the spotlight right on her face. It had, had been on my <laughs> And that, that was just unbelievable. And we actually have a uh, black and white picture of that. And it's been over eight years since you'd seen each other real face to face, hasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, wow. He looked pretty good to me though. Skinny, but good. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. What do you remember? You go ahead. <laughs> I 
I just, I had just, I just remember picking my kids up, you know, thinking I just couldn't believe they were one and two when I left and they were seven and eight. And I just couldn't believe that it was the same kids, you know, it was just wonderful. I saw my mom and dad, I was single, I wasn't married and my mom and dad were there, my brother and his wife and uh, their son, my nephew, I hadn't seen before. He was born while I was gone. And I guess I just uh, felt uh, a great relief for them because I knew they had struggled and worked so hard, but they had struggled emotionally all that time I was gone. And uh, it was just nice. There was a lot of joy there. That's what I, I'd say. There's a lot of joy for all of us. I'll continue on a little. Uh, after seeing Louise in the car, of course, run around, jumped in the back seat. We had a big hug. But we went to the visiting officers' quarters there at Maxwell, and I was kind of hoping I'd have some time alone with Louise just to catch up on what happened in the family and everything else. But uh, we walked into the VOQs, and there was uh, my three children. The, uh, my son, almost eight years old, he was born after I was shot down, was really uh, a wonderful, wonderful meeting for me. And the girls screamed and came over and hugged me. I picked up Lyle and hugged him, and he really didn't hug back. But I understood that. Uh, here's this strange man in the middle of the night picking him off the floor. But uh, we had gifts. We gave each other there. <clears throat> my mother and father were there. Louise were there, the three children, of course. My brother and uh, Louise's sister and her husband and their two children. Louise's mother and her grandmother. So it wasn't a very small meeting and escort officers, too. But uh, we were all exchanging gifts. And I looked over, and my son was sitting in an easy chair across the room. And I just turned to him and opened my arms, and he came running. That was an emotional moment. One thing I tell people about, I said in the foreword to your book, Smitty, is that the Harris family, they're still celebrating and having a reunion. <laughs> <laughs> they're all, they all pretty much live there in, in Tupelo, and you see each other all the time, and you're very, very close. And now you've got, what, four, you got great grandchildren now. Yes. <laughs> We have four great grandchildren. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cast of thousands when we get together. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, one of the things I'd like to do very quickly is to show a video of um, of uh, Guy Gruder's um, homecoming, just very quickly to kind of give you more of a flavor of what it was like to come home. If you want to launch the video real quick, and then we'll come back to some questions. I've got lots of questions. I'm a librarian, so. <laughs> that was in daytime. Mm -hmm. Does this bring back memories? Yes. It sure does. <laughs> Good memories. Ah, you look pretty young there. Yeah. <laughs> Younger, no doubt. <laughs> oh. Hmm. 
Yeah, I had so three just, three sisters uh -huh. married at that time, and I haven't I hadn't met either one any of their husbands until this homecoming. This is the first time I met their husbands. Wow. So speaking of changes, um, while you're away, what were some of the biggest changes you noticed about America after coming back and being home a few months? What were some of the like the things that surprised you the most? Well, I think there was just a, a lack of respect for authority, whether it was in the school, the church, or even in within families, uh, our society had just gotten a lot weaker. And uh, <clears throat> I think the Vietnam War was mostly the cause of that. People didn't understand it, and they were not kept up to date with the true facts. And uh, they were turned against the war, and not only against the war, but against all authority in the uh, armed services and actually when a lot of the men in south vietnam came home uh they couldn't wear their uniforms or they would be booed and they'd be spit on and they were just disrespected and i think that was the biggest change in our society that i saw Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. The anti-war thing was uh, a, a, a just a tremendous uh, and an unbelievable thing to us, and I think to most everybody who came back from Vietnam. We'd seen the truth over there, and the American people were not given the truth. They really weren't in any way. You know, when I was in the 173rd for seven months out in the biggest battles in 1967 against the North Vietnamese in the Central Highlands, in all those those seven months of really tough fighting, we never saw one reporter. They were all back in Saigon and Da Nang and the bars and the hotels. And there was no, there was absolutely no experience of the truth, which is what we fought a very moral war. I'm writing a book now called How Vietnam Won the Cold War Against Russia. And the fact is, and this is from 25 books written in Russian by all the top Russian leadership from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And they all say one thing, Vietnam bankrupted the USSR and won the Cold War. So, and no, if you notice, the Cold War ended on December 25th, 1991, a signal by God that he won it. And he won it because of Vietnam and the prayers of Americans and people all over the world to avoid nuclear war. It worked. But the actual way that God won it was to bankrupt the Soviet Union with the tremendous stretching that they had to do to fight us in Vietnam. I might add that our homecoming was very much unlike the men who were fighting in the South. We were welcomed as heroes uh, more than we, we deserved, I think. But nevertheless, the whole country was uh, happy about something, <laughs> something about Vietnam. And they welcomed us, and that was a big, big deal. Yeah, I think uh, kind of going in a different direction for a second here, the big thing that surprised me was the clothes that men were wearing were different, <laughs> had bell-bottom trousers. <laughs> and we really liked those uh, short skirts that the gals were wearing. But, uh, <laughs> that was a, kind of a nice thing. And then... Um, I guess my biggest challenge coming home was uh, if I went shopping and I, you know, after I left home and went back active duty air force and I was, you know, a bachelor and had to buy my food and stuff. And I go to the grocery store and uh, buy some cereal. Well, oh my gosh, there's 26 different kinds of cereal. Which one do I buy? And I was just stand there and look. And I don't know, okay, I finally learned just pick one. If you don't like it, don't buy it next time. The same thing with deodorant or shaving cream, you know. There's so many different brands, 
and it was just a different world than we had known before we went over. So I finally just decided, okay, I'll pick something. If I don't like it, I won't do it next time. And I still do that, actually, when I'm faced with a lot of uh, choices like that. So do you have any funny stories about um, returning stateside? Is there any funny, something funny or something inspirational that happened to you when you returned stateside? We were in such a state of euphoria. Everything was happy for us. And um, our, our welcome home and being together with our family, uh, that was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I had. I had a, a guy that was um, in, that I was with in cells in North Vietnam, a, a guy who was a uh, football player in Ohio and so on. And he was with us there at uh, Maxwell. And one of, one of the things that happened on the second day we were there is he came up to my sister, Faith. Uh, we had had in the last couple of years, they had let us have some photographs of our family uh, for the first two and a half years, we were not allowed to have any photographs, but for Smitty, it was longer than that. But for Lee and I, it was the first couple, two and a half years, no photographs of the family or letters even. But we got these photographs, and this uh, fellow came, the guy's name was Mike, Mike Burns, and he came up to my daughter, Faith, and he said, do you realize, do you, pardon me, my, uh, his sister. Yeah, his, his he sister. came up to my sister, Faith, and he said to her, Faith said, a picture of you is what got me through the last couple of years in prison camp. I was ready to give up, and I saw your picture. He was a bachelor when he came home. Of course, Faith was married by that time, but he said, your picture is what kept me going, and I'm not kidding. And, uh, so my last question is about work. So once you returned, and whether you stayed with the service or not, um, what challenges did you do? what challenges did you have trying to kind of reintegrate into the service or a job or what was that like trying to to re, you know resume that role that you had before you left if you were in the service well for me i was trying to catch up i was able to get by on five or six hours sleep uh i went to the air war college and in one month, I finished off my undergraduate degree and signed up for night school at Auburn University for a master's. And the Air War College itself is a master's level program. So I was doing two masters at the same time and it did them both in one year and also spent all the time I could at the kids' events their basketball games and taking them take off the whole weekend to take them someplace fun just to be together uh, we used every minute of the time just to the maximum we have a really funny picture of us right after he, smitty had come home and our local reporter who was very kind to me during those years said, Louise, please let me come take a picture. And she did. And Smitty and I both looked like somebody blacked our eyes. We were both so tired, <laughs> but we were also smiling at the time and the kids were happy. So life was good. I guess uh, in some ways the POW experience uh, Help, well, in many ways, I think it did all of us. It helped us to grow in areas where we needed to grow. We, you couldn't hide things in the POW camp. Uh, your roommates are gonna see it and point it out, areas where you might need to grow. And sometimes in, in our dreams, we would see something we were missing. And uh, in my, uh, I've been there about three or four months and I had this nightmare one night, my eighth grade science teacher, Ms. Jordan, walked over to my desk in eighth grade science class and she looked down and she said, Lee, she said, 
you know, if you do your homework, you could be a good student. And I realized when I woke up that she was exactly right. I'd never done all my homework. If they gave us 10 math problems, I'd do five. And I'd say, why should I waste time doing five more? If I can do these five, no, don't worry about it. Well, uh, I've now written six books, <laughs> but I learned to focus. I probably was ADD, but I learned to focus on my work. And so that really helped me, actually, that POW experience helped me as a person to become a more effective person after I came home. I think, I think it helped me. I had a, a trouble with uh, tr trust, trusting people just because of the North Vietnamese and things that I'd seen of communism, which I just couldn't believe the system. I, it just was very hard to believe the system. It was that they really would be such liars and so vicious and so on. So it was a very, very tough time for me. And it took me many, many years to get over uh, the way I felt about that and to start trusting people uh, without, you know, looking at them askance saying, well, what do you really mean? Or, you know, what is your, because for all those years and the interrogations, everything they say is a lie. And it's very hard to come back to trusting people to tell the truth as an example. Took many years for that to happen, but because really literally of prayer, I finally got back, you know, over 10 or 15 years to where I came back to realizing it's not up to me to judge whether they're lying or not. That's their problem. You know, I got to trust them, period, end of story, but it took me a long time to get over that kind of thing. Well, thank you very much for for answering some of our questions. I believe people in the room also have a few questions and also in the chat room. I think Lexi's been monitoring Fast and Furious typing to see if there's any questions. Anybody here have a question? I got one. Okay. Uh, did y'all get back on flying status with the Air Force at all? Well, uh, those of us who were uh, physically able and wanted to were offered in the Air Force, the opportunity to go out to Randolph Air Force Base and check out in the T-38. But we did not then or, or later fly with the Air Force. I mean, after that training, uh, you just could only fly if your assignment was flying. Right. Did not permit anyone just to get four hours a month as they had years before. Yes, I uh, I took some vacation, R and R type, uh, with my family and everything, and then I went back to San Antonio, Randolph Air Force Base. There, they were the ones that were going to requalify us, and I requalified for flying. And I was going to go back to the F four, but. The Arab-Israeli War uh, of 60, September 60, uh, 73, we gave so many, uh, October 73, we gave so many of our parts that the F-4 guys were getting 10 hours a month, and I'd been sitting on the ground for six years, so I needed to get back flying. So what I did was uh, just became a T-38 instructor pilot and went back to Valdosta, Georgia as a T-38 instructor pilot. and had a great career and a uh, great flying career. And then I moved on into some leadership skills in the Air Force. So yes, uh, they did requalify. And some of the guys went back to fighters, uh, especially the younger guys. And uh, we, it was, it all worked out well. And I had, I had, uh, I had two ejections and I was badly torn up on those ejections. So uh, they wouldn't let me fly. Uh, fighters because uh, of back problems and neck problems. But basically, uh, I decided to get out and join the airlines, and I flew with the Eastern uh, Airline Company and retired as a captain with them. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, I never, I, I always thought that, you know, if I had, if I'd been able to fly fighters, I would have stayed in and, and really enjoyed it. But I really enjoyed, the reason I really joined the Air, really joined the Air Force was to fly, uh, in combat, I really did join for combat uh, from the beginning. Uh, that's back in 59, that's why I joined. My dad was in all of World War II from North Africa through Germany uh, with the Army. And uh, I just always wanted to be in combat. 
if I couldn't be in combat, I didn't want to be in the service. We have got a question. Oh, go ahead. There are some questions on the uh, chat thing. Do we want to hit those right quick? Sure. Yeah, this is from Rob from online. He says, did your captors change at all after the U.S. pulled out of Vietnam? Since you remained behind, did torture or propaganda increase or decrease towards the end? Well, to clarify, I'll, I'll mention to clarify first, uh, to, specifically, the U.S. did not do final withdrawal until the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 1973, and that's when we came home. There were still about 25,000 soldiers left in Vietnam as they approached the signing. So, but the treatment did change earlier, but I'll let one of the other guys tell why it changed and how it changed. I'll talk, I'll talk to that briefly. I saw that, in my opinion, the treatment changed absolutely drastically with the Sante raid by our special forces of Army, Navy, Air Force. It was an unbelievable change to me. They took us from 15 different prisons down to just the Hanoi Hilton and seven big dungeons. And now all of a sudden, instead of one and two man cells, we're in 40 to 50 man dungeons. And that was like, doesn't sound like it to Americans, but believe me, that was heaven on earth to be with 40 to 50 American service men, Army and you know Navy and Air Force mostly. And uh, it was just all the difference in the world and that was all because of the Sante raid. That also was done, and that was 1970, late late November of 70. And the reason, and that was a big deal because that was the last two and a half years of the war that they didn't have the constant interrogations and torture for meeting the delegations, you know, from the United States and Europe, which was our biggest fear up there, is being a a, a traitor on international television. Of course, it wasn't treason. They can torture anybody to do that. And they, you know, there's no doubt of that. Okay. But the American people and the world people don't know that. But that's why Napoleon said anybody listens to a soldier in the hands of the enemy is an absolute fool. And, you know, in my opinion, one of the laws that ought to be passed is no reporter can ever interview any soldier in the hands of the enemy because it's such a terrible fear in prison camp when you know that given enough time, they can make you meet a delegation and appear to be on the side of the enemy in one way or the other. And it just is a terrible thing that should never happen. But that all went away with the Sante raid. This was an American special operations that came in there and it changed our lives, in my opinion, from hell to heaven as far as a communist prison is concerned. Yeah, it was a big deal. I had lived at Sante and I agree, that was really changed our lives when we moved back to Camp Unity. But there was one other thing happening at that time and that was the wives. They got organized and they put the pressure on our country to change their policy from keep quiet to go public. And they, these women flew around the, some of them visited 20 or 30 countries and met with the uh, people there to put pressure on them to put pressure on the communists to change our treatment. And uh, that was the, the two things kind of working together really brought uh, that change in treatment for us. And it was amazing how much that raid and the, what the wives and families were doing back home really did to change our treatment. You know, I agree with all of that, but also I think our treatment changed when Ho Chi Minh passed away. Uh, yeah. We went from being tortured and mistreated to a much less effort on their part, only uh, not as much torture and we were treated better. Yep. Exactly. Great. Well, we have, one, we have another question from online. This is from Kay Walsh and they say, what character traits do you feel are most important for young leaders today? Well, one for young leaders today, 
be red, white, and blue, and have faith. Uh, those are the backbone issues, and particularly faith, that if you're strong in, in those areas, you're going to be fine as a leader in, in the military. I write a lot about uh, character and so on and about leadership, but the core of all leadership and of all human uh, existence is character, courage, and commitment. Whether it's in marriage, <laughs> war, leadership in any company, you have to have character. You have to have courage to maintain your character because we're human beings. I mean, every I mean, Illinois had three governors go to prison. If you go online and Google mayors in jail, I mean, there are mayors in jail from every major city in the country almost. So pastors that are have violated their character, whatever your role is, you're one step away from being a crook. And so you better have character. You got to have courage to do the right thing when you're faced with difficult decisions. And you've got to have commitment to your goals and to being who you claim you are. And you're going to be in a battle every day. We have a, on our website, we have an honor code, seven articles. And they sound, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, when you try to do those every day, I'm telling you, you're going to face uh, difficult decisions because it's easy to slip away sometimes to protect your image or you have shame or guilt. And you start slipping away to try to protect those uh that's what happens to so many people. And we read about them in the, every day in the paper. When I went to San Antonio to speak at USAA a few years ago, the front page of the paper had an article about the lawyer who pleads guilty to bribing the judge. <laughs> and it went from there in the first section of that San Antonio paper, which was laying on the counter in the sign-in at the hotel, there were 14, I count them, 14 articles about leaders in the community violating integrity and violating the law. So I'm telling you, we're all one step away. You better work at being the person you claim to be and want to be. And amen, amen to that character is a key thing. And when you look at the studies, you know, over and over again, when they find out what really makes a good leader with the examples of the leaders, the key characteristic of the character is humility, humility, humility. And that's totally opposite to what the, te the world tells you. But Eisenhower said it best. Leadership, he said, is very, very easily summed up in two things. Number one, you take blame for everything that goes wrong, and you give credit for everything that goes right to your boss, your peers, and your people. You, you take blame for everything that goes wrong as far as your boss is concerned, your peers are concerned, and your people are concerned. You take the blame, and your only job is to give credit to your boss, to your peers, to your people for everything that goes right. You give the credit to them. You take the blame, okay? And and actually, he did it with the, there's a right on the Pentagon. You can see if you go to the Pentagon, look it up. It's a letter that he wrote after it looked like the landings into Europe, you know, the big landings was in France at the Cherbourg Havre beachhead there. It was lost. It looked like we were going to be kicked off. And he wrote a letter. He penned a letter taking full blame for that failure of the landing in Europe, okay? So he not just... He didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. And again, he's the greatest combat leader in history, and in my opinion, the greatest political history and, and uh, leader in history because he set up the Cold War and the code of conduct was that right from his, right from him. And remember, the code of conduct is what, going back to what Lee and Smitty say, the, the, key, the key sentence of the code of conduct is, I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America, do the right thing, be humble, be all for your boss, your people, and your peers, and the heck with yourself. If you can get out of careerism, stop it. You know, just make everybody else try, try to promote everybody else around you before you. If you can do that, you're a perfect leader because everybody's going to be on your side when they see that you really mean it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, we have another question online and they wanted to know if you guys have visited revisited vietnam since the war i didn't hear that say that again 
Have y'all gone back to Vietnam after the war? <laughs> yes, I went back in 2014, and uh, I had a tour guide in Hanoi, and uh, the people were all nice to me, and uh, uh, we went to the real Hanoi Hilton, the Hilton Opera House Hotel, and had lunch. They treated us, and then we went down to the Hanoi Hilton. But uh, overall, I think most all of our uh, Vietnam POWs have a lot of Vietnamese friends, either in Vietnam or in the U.S. here that have come here. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, because of China, Vietnam is growing closer to our country every day. And most of the people in Vietnam really love the United States, but more and more of them hate the communists. <laughs> So if nobody else has any questions, um, I wondered if it would be okay if I asked Miss Louise a question. Um, being a, now my husband's retired, but being a military wife and you know, going through de deployments and things like that, nothing like what you went through, what, what advice do you have for, for wives or husbands that, you know, now husbands are also um, having their wives deploy, what advice do you have um, to give on how to keep your faith and how to keep your spirits up and and that kind of thing. And how did you, I mean, how did you manage? Would you mind sharing? Well, I think it goes back to what the guy has said. It's about faith. It's about making commitments that you plan to keep forever. And I, I really think without faith, uh, it would have been a longer road than it was. But uh, we were very blessed. We had a strong family. And when you have three little ones, uh, one of them born two months after Smitty was shot down, uh, you're busy and uh, you don't have time to pay attention to what you need that moment. You have to get on with the program. And you also have to stand up and decide who you are and where you are and where you want to be ultimately. And I knew ultimately I wanted to be with Carlisle Smith Harris at home and back in the United States but along the way, there were so many people that were kind and helpful and really restore your faith as well. So that's what it's all about and blessings. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Any other questions from anybody? Anything online or? I think all we've got lots of gratitude and um, people who say how much they have enjoyed this. So we'll be sending you guys all the comments that we're getting online for you guys to read. All right, well, Colonel Harris, Colonel Ellis, Captain Gruners, and Mrs. Louise, uh, thank you so much for today and uh, taking time with us and sharing your experiences. We so appreciate it. And looking forward to more events um, in the area next month. Uh, thank you for you know being a part of our kickoff event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice. Thank you all. And uh, really appreciate Maxwell Air Force Base. <laughs> it was the first step we took in uh, United, back in the United States uh, for us. So we always have memories of returning and walking off that C-141 there at Maxwell Air Force Base. Very special. I would like to make one short statement. I think that all of us realize that the net effect of our incarceration in North Vietnam has been a positive thing in our lives. Well, we grew as individuals. We found out a lot about ourselves. We found a lot about our faith. And we really had time to consider what life is really all about and the values that we had were just increased uh, because we were there and we've forgotten the pain and things now mostly and we know that the net effect on our lives has been positive amen you know um I always close my presentations with a quote from the Lord of the Rings trilogy, actually from the Return of the King. This is in the trailer online. You can go online and see it. 
It says there's no freedom without sacrifice. There's no victory without loss. And there's no glory without suffering, which is what Smitty just said. We suffered, but there was some glory in our suffering. And I always add one more. There's no honor without courage. I wouldn't recommend what we did, though. No. <laughs> Smitty, Smitty, at our 40th, uh, well, I think it was our 40th. We were sitting at, we at a reunion in San Antonio a few years ago. Maybe it was the 45th. But we were all sitting around the table there. We have a hospitality room, and we, there were seven of us who had roomed together sitting around this table talking and visiting. And one of the guys said, you know, guys, I would never volunteer to be a POW, but I wouldn't change a thing. And everybody at that table agreed. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. Well, again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure you have other things to do with your day, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Right. Thank, thank you. you for having us. That's great.